Eyes for Allah, nothing but Allah. Ba is the beginning of Bismillah. Ta is for taqwa, bewaring of Allah. And tha is for thawab, a reward. Ja is for Jannah, the garden of paradise. Ha is for Hajj, the blessed pilgrimage. Kha is for Khatim, the seal of the prophethood given to the prophet. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala al-mab'uuthi rahmatan lil'alameen Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Amma ba'd Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to this new episode of Ask Huda coming to you live from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia our first question is from Anam it says if one is not sure how many times he or she washed a body part can he or she wash that part one more time during wudu this question a lot of the Muslims ask and these simple things if we as Muslims are, a are able to put the guidelines and know our parameters we would be in no need to ask similar questions in the future what does that mean fiqh or jurisprudent or the rulings of your forms of worship in particular are governed by Quran verses hadiths and the scholars have simplified these rules and regulations to be easy to comprehend and each one has its evidence to support it so when someone asks you about the pillars of wudu what are the pillars? If I miss one, my wudu is invalid. The answer would be washing your face, which includes turning the water in your, in your mouth and sniffing the water up your nostrils and blowing it out. Washing your arms from the hands till the elbows. Wiping over your head, which includes the ears. Number four, washing your feet up to the ankles. Number five, the order which I had just mentioned these four pillars in face, arms, head, and feet as in accordance to the ayah in Surah Al-Ma'idah chapter 5 and finally number 6 that it should be simultaneous there should not be a gap between these pillars answering the phone then coming back to continue no this is no go so if you know this, you don't have to ask questions regarding to the pillars of wudu because now you understand the verse, you understand the sunnah, end of story. We come to the question. One is in doubt whether he washed two or three times his arm, for example. S to be safe, would he be allowed to wash it for a, a, another extra time? If you knew the sunnah, you wouldn't have asked this question. So what is the sunnah, Shaykh? Teach us. No problem. The Prophet used to wash, alayhi salatu wasalam, each limb once. And he did that twice, and he did that three times. And he used to vary. So he washes his face once, and he washes his arms twice, and he wipes over the head once, he washes his feet three times. There's no consistency. It's all, alhamdulillah, allowed. However, the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, did not exceed over three times so he told us not to do this so if you are in doubt whether he washed it once twice or three times this is sufficient there's no need to be doubtful what you have done is sufficient but if you fear that you will be making the fourth in this case this is not permissible and you have to refrain from doing that Rihanna from Saudi Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu uh, Sheikh Asim, I wanted to know regarding the month of Rajab and Shaban, uh, so many uh, unauthentic things are being spread on media like FB and WhatsApp. 
they are circulating so many things so just uh, throw some light uh, uh, according to Quran and Sunnah on about these two uh, two months okay. Jazakallahu khair Wa jazakum Wa alaikum salam wa alaikum salam Fatima from Saudi Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I have two questions Yes uh, My first question is uh, what is the ruling on cutting one's own hair in the state of Iran like if somebody is planning to go to Umrah can a person cut her own hair Second question the rights of Umrah and my second question is uh, uh, while doing the sari uh, can we take a break because uh, if old people they cannot uh, do sari at a stretch so can they sit between for a minute or two and then take, complete the rounds of sari Okay any more questions No thank you jazakumullah khairan Wa jazakum I will answer inshallah Rayhana's first question about the month of Rajab and Sha'ban. This requires a lot of talk about it, and I'm afraid this is not the right platform to do so, but in a nutshell, what circulates in social media and WhatsApp, Allahumma barik lana fi Rajab wa Sha'ban wa balighna Ramadan. This is not authentic hadith, so you should not uh, uh, make dua in it. Uh, regarding sh uh, the month of Rajab. M the month of Rajab is one of the sacred four months of the year. So we have the month of Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah, Muharram, and Rajab. Three, Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah, and Muharram are in a row. The 11th, the 12th, and the first month of the lunar year. While Rajab, which we are presently in is the seventh year or uh, the seventh month of the lunar year they are seek, sacred in the sense that Allah Azza wa instructed us as in Surah At-Tawbah chapter 9 that Allah made them sacred and we should not transgress or wrong ourselves by committing sins so it has this uh, uh, blessing of it that one should be careful not to sin as usually done in other months though sin is haram in all uh, the months of the year 24 7 but it has more gravity to it seriousness in these four months what people think that fasting in Rajab is recommended this is baseless the Prophet was not reported that he used to fast exceptionally in Rajab it was like any other month what people report that on the 27th of this month it is the night of uh, al-isra wal mi'raj the night journey the miraculous night journey i don't know what they call it in urdu because most of these innovations come to us from there where they say shabi barat or uh, maybe this is the, the the middle of shaban and something else similar to it this is all baseless and it has no uh, um, advantage or edge over any other night and to specify it with Salatul Tasabih or any other Salat this is an innovation and it is prohibited the month of Sha'ban is different the Prophet ﷺ used to fast a lot of it and he used to justify this by saying a lot of the people are neglectful because it's before Ramadan and it's after Rajab, which is a sacred month, and people are neglectful. They don't pay attention to it. So I'd like to fast, and he used to fast a lot of it, if not all. So this is recommended. Having a night in the middle of Sha'ban, the 15th of Sha'ban, thinking that it's sacred and one should pray Salatul Raga'ib or Tasabih or etc. of these innovative prayers, all of this is baseless, and Allah knows best. Uh, Fairuz from... Fairuz? Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. You're from? USA. USA. Okay. What can I do for you? Yes. I have a question. Um, yeah. I want to know what's the rule regarding um, hair extension. Okay. Any more questions? No. That'll be. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Fatima from Saudi Arabia. She says, what's the ruling on a muhrim, a person in the state of Ihram who has just concluded his umrah? to cut or clip his own hair the answer is this is permissible there's nothing wrong in that and 
for the brothers, all what they have to do is to clip from all over their head, not from one side or from right and left, back and forward, and that's it. The clipping should be from all over the hair. For the sisters, she just holds her hair in a bunch, and she cuts this much of it. That is it. So all of her hair, she holds it as a bunch, and she cuts this little of it, and this is uh, sufficient, inshallah. Her second question, she says, during Sa'i, when we make Sa'i between Safa and Marwa, if the elders felt a bit tired, can they pause for a minute or two? During Tawaf, during Sa'i, the short pause, if it were for a legitimate reason, does not invalidate the Sa'i nor the Tawaf. Meaning, if I am making the Sa'i and I felt thirsty, so I stopped to drink water, washed my face, sat for a while, and moved on, no problem. If the prayer was cold and I stopped to pray Asr or Dhuhr, four rak'ahs or Isha, whatever, and this is a pro uh, approximately 10 minutes or 11 good minutes, and then I continue, no problem. The problem is that if you're in the third round and you thought that, oh, I, I want to answer the call of nature. So you go to your room, you answer the call of nature, and then he said, why not take a shower? You take a shower, you answer a few emails, and you go back. No, this invalidates your sa'i because the gap was too long and not for a, a legitimate reason. So I hope this answers your question. Mustafa from Nigeria. Yes, Mustafa, listen to me from the phone, please. Okay. Yeah, please, uh, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum, Okay. How are you doing, Sheikh? I am fine, Zakallah Khair, for asking. Yeah, please, my question is this. I want to know the authenticity of this hadith. Okay. The hadith is found in uh, Bayhati and Sunan in Nisai. It's about uh, women wearing perfumes. Wearing what? Perfume, perfume. Perfumes, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the hadith, the hadith, hadith of Abba Hurera. The hadith of Abba Hurera, uh, he met a lady on the way. Okay. When he saw her, he said, I need to redeem all at al masjid. Kala, wali ayi shayin tatiba biha, hadat tayyib. Kala, lil masjid, faqala Allah. قالت الله قال الله قالت الله قال إن أبا القاسم أخبرني أنه لا تقبل لا تقبل المرأة صلاة طبيبة بطيب لغير زوجها حتى تختفي منه فصل الجنابة. Okay. So I want to know if a woman perfume wears perfume she has to do غسل if she she wears it in public. Okay. Any more questions, Mustafa? Mm, that, that, that will be all for now. Okay, I will answer inshallah. Uh, Abu Yusuf from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Shaykh. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shaykh, uh, I have a couple of questions. Yes. Uh, when we sit after Fajr Salah until Ishraq, we offer two rakahs. Hmm. Then there is a hadith, you have, have heard your programs. Yes. That it's you know, we'll get the thawab for Hajj and Umrah. Okay. Okay. Then suppose, what about the physical Hajj? If we perform physical Hajj, what is the difference between that and this? Okay. Second question. Uh, so we have uh, gone for Hajj long time back, 25 years before. Maybe we have uh, we have done many Hajjs. But we, every time we were informed that there is no need for a local residence to perform the Vidai Tawaf okay. of Hajj. So we have not performed those days. So our Hajj was valid or we have to perform right now. Where, do, where do you reside? In Jeddah. Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Any more questions? And then in the subcontinent, usually the Avan says, after half an hour, as, uh, as usual, the offer uh, when the salah time enter, like Dhuhr salah, around quarter to one, in, as per the Muslim pro, 
when you see in that then after that they uh, they give in masjids azan very late you know very well yes. like like asar they give five o'clock sometime like that so can the ladies women who offer the prayers at home can they offer before the adhan call in the masjids in the home before the adhan of the masjid okay can they offer like that uh, prayers at home first okay. and all that okay yeah that's all thank you very much i appreciate it. you're welcome akhi hayak allah uh, aziza from qatar yeah assalamu alaikum sir assalamu wa rahmatullah uh, i have a question uh if what is the ruling for a woman if they want to do hair coloring uh like uh, not using henna, but the, the, the commercial one. Okay. Uh, that's only my question. Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Okay, jazakallah khairan. Wajazakum. Barakallahu feek. Fairuz from USA, she says, what is the ruling on hair extensions? Now, the issue of hair extensions was mentioned in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. May Allah be pleased with him where he narrated that the Prophet والسلام, cursed those who extend hair to other women and the women who get their hair extended. May Allah curse the women who do this and have it done for them. So anything that falls under this category is considered prohibited and a major sin because anything that the Prophet ﷺ curses or tells us that the curse of Allah is upon a person who does that particular sin then this is a major sin therefore any woman who extends her hair with hair extensions so that you think her hair is longer or her hair is thicker then she falls under this hadith if she wears a wig without any legitimate reason and the only legitimate reason I may know of is a woman losing her hair totally and completely until she's bald in this case she may wear a wig it's halal because this is covering a defect or something that is an abnormality which is halal so if a woman extends her hair with something that looks like hair to people this is totally prohibited if she does this with a piece of cotton or fabric that she puts it under her hair so that her hair would look bigger and thicker this is also prohibited but if she braids her hair with ribbons or with cotton lines that are obvious to those who see they're yellow they're brown they are different fabrics and colors of of satin or of of any nylon that people know that this is not hair so such ribbons are okay and i hope this answers your question abdullah from iraq assalamu alaikum sheikh assalamu alaikum how are you allah yihayyik barakallah feek it is good to have you back on satellite zakallah khair ya what can i do for you I have a question. Yes, uh, sir. Is it permissible for a student and not to fast in some days of Ramadan, uh, of Ramadan because of their uh, exam uh, examination during examination? Okay. As this is. Is not, it not is it a physical examination or just writing? Yes, yes, it's a physical examination. No, no, it is the it's the, uh, the writing, okay. not a physical, uh, not a physical. Uh, I will I will answer you, Akhi Abdullah. Any more questions? Barakallahu feek. Mustafa from Nigeria, he says that there is a hadith that was reported in Al Nasai, a Sunan Nasai, and Al Bayhaqi, and elsewhere. And in short, Abu Huraira met a woman who was wearing perfume. So he said, where, where are you going, O slave of Allah? And she said, to the masjid. And she, he asked her, and why are you wearing this perfume? She said, for the sake of the masjid. He said, by Allah? And she said, yes, by Allah. And he, in this case, he asked her, he told her, informed her, that I heard the Prophet Sallallahu saying that whoever wears perfume Allah Azza wa and leaves her home 
Allah Azza wa Jal would not accept her prayers until she perform ritual uh, 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 ghusl as of the major ritual impurity. So she has to take a bath, she has to shower herself. And scholars differed in the interpretation of this hadith. And the most authentic opinion is that this is not to be taken as it is an obligation. But rather that Allah Azza wa would not, not reward a woman in such status with full reward for her prayer because of her disobedience to the Prophet ﷺ. Wearing perfume for women, if she is in her home, if she is with her husband, if she is around her non mahram men, let me rephrase that. If she is around her mahram men, such as brothers, father, sons, uh, nephews, uncles, all of this is halal. If she's among women, no problem. Wear whatever you want. But for a man who's an unmahram, to find the scent, the smell of the perfume a woman is wearing, this is a major sin. The Prophet said, whoever wears perfume among the women and she goes out, passes by men, and they find her scent, her smell, her perfume, she is as if she is a fornicator. Allah will punish her this much. Because in so many times, you could have a woman as ugly as, an, uh, as a gorilla. Though I don't believe that there are ugly women. But it, it's, it depends on uh, the way you look at it. Let's assume there is a woman who is as ugly as a gorilla. And she is covered from head to toe. But she wears perfume. The moment she passes by men, heads will turn. Shaitan utilizes this and throws in each one's mind that this is Miss uh, uh, Universe 2016. Because of the smell. And he doesn't know what's underneath. And therefore, Islam protects women as well as men from falling in the uh, uh, traps of Shaitan by ordering the women not to wear perfume when they go out. So the most authentic opinion that Abu Huraira's hadith is to encourage women not to do so and to force women who do such things, which is haram, to put perfume and go out, to go and bathe as if they have a major ritual impurity, to deter them, to prevent them from doing this in the future, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. We have a short break. Stay tuned. And inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, No one's wealth helped me as much as the wealth of Abu Bakr helped me. After which Abu Bakr began to weep and say, And is my life and wealth for anything besides you, O Messenger of Allah? This narration shows the level of etiquette and humbleness that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, had in the presence of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for he likened himself to a slave of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by saying that his wealth was only for the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well as his soul and self this comes as no surprise for the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has more right on the believers than themselves. He, may Allah be pleased with him, spent his wealth in the cause of Allah and he consoled the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through his own self. So the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recognized that for him and said in order to build his stature and to remind the Ummah of his virtues no one's wealth helped me as much as the wealth of Abu Bakr helped me. Among the benefits of this narration, it is important 
to keep good manners and humbleness in the presence of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, thanking someone who has bestowed some favor on you, as well as supplicating for them is part of having good manners. Reported by Al-Bukhari, reported by Al-Tirmidhi, and Ibn Majah, Albani ruled it authentic in his book Sahih Al-Jami'. The explanation of As-Sindi on the book of Ibn Majah and At-Taysir Bisharh Al-Jami' As-Saghir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. We have uh, Mahmoud. Brother Mahmoud. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum, Sam. You from? South Africa. Oh, South Africa. Oh, Khantid. Jazakallah. Barakallah. Hayyakallah. Yes. Sheikh, Jazakallah for the wonderful program. I have a question here. In our locality, some people claim to have the hair of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay. And they say that this hair grows, and then they have a function where they call it. Uh, they have ziyarat, uh, baal mubarak of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay. Can we? Uh, there's no authentic hadith, or they don't have a chain of narration to say where they got this hair from. So should we believe in this uh, matter? Or okay. Should we disregard it? Any more questions? Abu Yusuf from Saudi Arabia, he says that Salatul Ishraq, we know that if you pray two rak'ahs after Fajr, if you, let me rephrase that, if you pray Fajr in the masjid with the Imam and then you stay and remain where you are making dhikr, reading the Quran until the sun rises about 15 minutes afterwards, you pray two rak'ahs, Allah would reward you the reward of a hajj and umrah. Perfect, perfect, perfect. As narrated by, uh, uh, as in the hadith of the Prophet So he says, now, what is the difference between this hajj and umrah and the actual fard of going once in a lifetime for hajj and umrah? Akhi, there is a, an issue in Arabic. I'm, I'm not sure if I can um, uh, translate this well into English, it's called al jaza wal ijza So, al jaza meaning the reward. al ijza is what clears your conscience and your liability and you're not requested or ordered to do this thing. So, for example, if I, if I for example, say, well, uh, uh, I, I have an, uh, uh, an oath upon myself, and a vow that I will recite the full Quran. So now Allah did what I wanted to happen, and I have to recite the whole Quran. And then I read the Quran, a hadith where it says the Prophet ﷺ, whoever recites Qul Hu Allahu Ahad three times, this is equivalent to reciting the whole Quran. So I said, hmm, I can do that. So I recite Qul Hu Allahu Ahad three times. Would this suffice? The answer is no. The reward is yes. But to suffice, you have to do the actual thing. Likewise, the Prophet said, whoever, alayhi salatu wasalam, says, la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu, lahu mulku wa lalhamdu yuhayimitu wa wa lakulli jayin qadir. Ten times, as if he set free four slaves of the offspring of Ismail, peace be upon him. So, for example, I was driving and I killed someone by mistake. So, what do I have to do? I have to free a slave. So, I say, hmm, I can say la ilaha illallah ten times, and then... I have three slaves extra. Would that do? No, because this is the equivalent to the reward, but not suffice. It does not suffice. So when you pray these two rak'ahs after Fajr for a full year, you get the reward of 360, more or less, Hajj and Umrah. But this does not suffice for the one single physical actual Hajj that you have to do in your lifetime, and I hope this answers your question. Nabila, I apologize for keeping you waiting from Malaysia. It's okay, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu rahmatullah. Yeah, I have a question here. Is it a sin for a wife to go out to do her daily routine without asking her husband permission because the husband doesn't care? 
Okay. Any more questions? Um, I think that's it. Is just want to clear my concern. Okay. I will answer you, inshallah. Barakallah fikum. Barakallah fikum. Abu Yusuf's second uh, question was that about 20, 25 years ago, he performed Hajj and he did not perform the farewell tawaf, known as tawaf al wida. So he says, is my Hajj valid? First of all, the Hajj is valid. You have no problem. Don't get goosebumps. Second of all, do I have to do anything to rectify not offering this tawaf? This depends. If you were instructed by a, a proper scholar, so you, for example, went with the Pakistani uh, uh, embassy and they had uh, a group of scholars and they said, no, this is okay, the residents of Jeddah don't have to do tawaf al-wada'. And they are trustworthy scholars, you don't have to do anything. Your sin is in their necks because they're the one who advise you. But if the one who told you you don't have to do tawaf al-wada'a is a layman, someone who is not to be trusted in his religion, who is not a student of knowledge, in this case you have to slaughter one sheep for every pilgrim who dropped tawaf al-wada'a. And both cases your hajj is valid insha'Allah. Aisha from Sudan. Aisha, listen to me from the phone, please. Assalamualaikum. Alaikum Hello. 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 Okay. Any more questions? No. Thank you. Uh, Abu Yusuf, a third question. He says that uh, the Hanafi Maslak or the Hanafi school of thought, they delay Fajr sometimes Dhuhr, and most of the time Asr, Adhan, from its prescribed time. And they go against the majority, the vast majority of scholars. And they're wrong in what they're doing. With all respect to the Hanafi Madhab, but as Muslims, we're obliged to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. So one would come and say, a devout Hanafi, you mean that Abu Hanifa does not know the Quran and Sunnah? I say, I did not talk about Abu Hanifa. May Allah have mercy on him. I respect him, and he's better than a, a gazillion one like me. But if you stand by Abu Hanifa and defend him, then the majority of the Muslims would stand with uh, Imam Malik, Shafi'i, and Ahmed ibn Hanbal, who are the majority, and stand be uh, behind them. Is it the quantity that determines who's right and who's wrong? Is it the size of the biceps? Is it the ammunition and the weaponry? No. It, if you differ, Allah says in the Quran, then refer to Allah and His Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Refer it back to the Quran and to the Sunnah. And in the crystal clear Sunnah, we learn that the methodology of calculating Asr prayer is wrong. Definitely, there's no doubt about it. So with all due respect, in this particular issue, it's totally wrong and unacceptable. The question is, women in their homes, they know that Asr prayer starts at 10 minutes to 4, the Adhan, according to the Shafi'i, Malki, and Hanbali school of thought. Ahnaf is about 40 minutes afterwards. So if they begin to pray before the Adhan, is it permissible? Totally permissible. This is totally permissible and according to the Sunnah and they're doing the right thing as long as the time for Asr is due. And Allah knows best. Aziza from Qatar, she says, what's the ruling on dyeing your hair? Not dyeing as in death, but rather coloring your hair uh, uh, in contemporary colors. It is not permissible to imitate the disbelievers. So you want to color your hair in a natural way by uh, uh, coloring it to be a redhead uh, or to be blonde, there's no problem. This is halal. This is natural. But if you want to color it in the color of pink, 
or green or uh, something that is obnoxious, something that would make people open their mouths and say, what the heck is this? No, this is not permissible. The Prophet ﷺ prohibited us from wearing something that draws attention, known as libas al-shuhra. And a woman must not imitate these actor, actresses and these singers, pop singers, by dyeing her hair in such an awful fashion and manner. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows uh, uh, best. Um, okay, Abdullah from Iraq, he says, is it permissible to break fasting of a day in Ramadan because of the examination? The answer is no. The Muslims used to fight in jihad, in physical jihad, while in the state of fasting. And this person wants to break fast to be able to... Fasting doesn't affect your concentration. You're not going to eat a burger or drink a cappuccino while answering your tests. You're going to be in, a, in, a, in an examination hall and you'll be writing so you don't you will not be affected by fasting none whatsoever so uh, uh, I hope this answers your question Um Fadl from Saudi Assalamu alaikum Shaykh Assalamu rahmatullahi wa barakatuh my question is uh, can ladies perform Umrah are, are they Muslims yeah they are Muslims can <laughs> they perform Umrah they are divorcee and they are widows where are Without they? any mehram available. Where, where are they? They are in Jeddah only, working okay. as teachers. So can they go to Makkah with a group of ladies and perform Umrah or Hajj? Okay, I will answer you. Thank you, Sheikh. You're welcome. Uh, Mahmoud from South Africa, he says that there is a cultural thing, and most of you probably had seen this video where people with Arab clothes and some are not, they have this uh, uh, box or container that has a long stretch of hair and they transport it through airplanes, etc., and they wash it and perfume it. And they claim that this is the hair of the Prophet ﷺ and it keeps on growing. So he's asking, it has, is this any, uh, does it have any authenticity to it? This is a total fabrication and they are making millions and billions of dollars out of this. That's really smart. When there are fools to be fooled, you, all what you have to do is come up with such a Ponzi scheme or such a, a, a silly thing. Akhi, the hair of the Prophet ﷺ, some of it was given to Umm Salama. Some of it was given to uh, 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 the Prophet's messengers, uh, uh, companions, Ali Sassam, the Prophet's companion, such as Khalid and Walid, who had some in his turban, etc. And none of them ever reported it growing, nor doing anything extra to it. So, in short, anything that's available nowadays in the market where people claim to be the hair of the Prophet, Ali Sassam, it is totally bogus, it is totally. Uh, baseless, it has no foundation. And if you go to uh, uh, some museums and they tell you that this is the sword of the Prophet, this is the cape of the Prophet, this is the turban of the Prophet, all of these are baseless and, has, uh, and, and have no credibility, none whatsoever. Being in a muse museum doesn't mean anything at all. So uh, neglect these poor things. Nabila from Malaysia, she says, uh, can a wife, uh, well, before going to um, Nabila, I think we have Sarah from Bahrain. Sarah, listen to me yeah. from the phone. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Mute your, your, your TV and listen to me from the phone, Sarah. Just my question is uh, uh, I heard from others. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I heard uh, from other sheikhs the uh, if any lady showing her uh, lady's hair, even one hair, uh, it, he she cannot smell in Jannah. So if it is like this, is it correct? If it is like that, I saw. I'm sorry to tell you, the holy country is Saudi Arabia. There is one channel. There is, a, but they were wearing nicely black abaya with the uh, black hijab. But 
they are showing little bit part of hair front side. So what will happen about this case if it is correct? Please okay. answer for me. I will answer you, inshallah. Uh, Aisha from Sudan, she says, Duha prayer, what do we recite in it? Is it like Fajr Sunnah? It's recommended to recite Qul Ya Al-Kafirun and uh, uh, chapter 112, Surah Al-Ikhlas, or anything. I do not remember any particular thing to recite in it. So the sky is the limit. You want to recite Surah Al-Baqarah? This is up to you. You want to recite Surah Al-Kafirun and Surah Al-Ikhlas like in Fajr and Maghrib Sunnah? This is totally permissible, alhamdulillah. Um Fadl from Saudi Arabia, she says, a divorcee or a widow, can she travel from Mecca, to, from Jeddah to Mecca to perform Umrah with a group of women? The answer is no problem because this is not traveling. It, the distance is about 80 kilometers and the people of Mecca work in Jeddah and commute twice a day, maybe more. And the people of Jeddah work in Mecca and do the same. So. The people of Mecca and Jeddah do not consider commuting between the two cities as traveling. And therefore, you do not require a mahram. Hajj, however, is a different issue. Because of the duration of the Hajj, which is three to five days, and because of the movement from Mina to Arafah to Muzdalifah to Mecca, this requires a mahram, and one should not go without a mahram. Sarah from Bahrain, she says, I heard that one of the shiyukh says whoever shows what uh, uh, even mounts to a single hair, a woman, from her hijab, then she will not find the scent and the smell of paradise. There isn't any such thing. There is no such hadith. So first of all, the hadith is wrong. And she says, if this is true, why do we find Saudi women appearing on a, a Saudi channel, though they are moderate and they are looking... Uh, uh, decent but exposing part of their hair well there, this is not the only single sin that you may see and as Muslims we care less what this country or this nationality or this government does because as Muslims we care only about Quran and Sunnah and if you go and scrutinize what you see on the media, you will find there is music, you will find there are movies, you will find there is free mixing, and some of those so-called decent uh, um, um, anchor women or uh, uh, presenters may be not that decent when they chit-chat with the opposite gender and laugh and crack jokes and smile and uh, do heinous things Islamically. As Muslims, these are not our role models. They're neglectful. May Allah guide them. We go back to the Quran and the Sunnah. This is what governs me and you. This is what governs everything on earth. Not what people put as rules and regulations. It's the Quran and Sunnah. What's halal and what's haram. If the Sharia is being implemented or not. So I hope this answers your question, uh, Sister Um Fadl, and it gives you a way of reflecting on what's happening around us. Don't look at what I do and say, well, Sheikh Hassam did this. And who am I? I'm a human being. I can fall and I can stand up. It, it, it's not that I'm infallible. I have my own shortcomings. What counts is what's in the Quran and in the Sunnah. Sarah from Bahrain. Well, actually, I just answered this. So uh, we go back to the emails. Uh, Nazira says, what is the difference between fard and wajib? Well, this, the majority of scholars consider them to be the same. So the Imam, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, and the most authentic opinion of Imam Ahmad is that they are identical. They're synonymous. They equal one another. If you do them, you're rewarded. If you don't do them, you're sinful and be, will be punished for that. The school of thought of the Hanafi school of thought, because they came the earliest and the first, they made a difference which is linguistic, but not practical. In, in practice, they're all the same. They agree with us. But in, uh, uh, um, linguistically, they say, fard is something like salat, five mandatory prayers. This is something that no one can doubt. 
while witter and growing the beard is wajib. The evidence is not that certain and evident. The evidence is considered to be ambiguous, uncertain, while the fard is certain and uh, evident uh, evidences to back it up. But again, it's the same thing. Tajmina says, is it obligatory for women to wear burqa or abaya during prayer, or is it enough to wear a set of loose, clo uh, uh, loose clothes that cover the body properly? If a woman, while she's praying, is wearing something that covers her body properly, meaning that if I see her as an unmahram, it's okay with her husband and with her father because she's properly covered. In this case, there's no problem. But if it, if let's assume a woman is thinking that she's wearing a loose t-shirt or a shirt and a skirt, the skirt is loose, but still it shows her waist. So this is not appropriate. If she bows or prostrates, then her body figure would show. No, she has to wear an external dress to cover it. But if she's wearing something that is really loose and doesn't show, then this is permissible, inshallah. And the second question, she says that the aura, if it was, so whether upper or lower body, if it was exposed, would this nullify the prayer? First of all, if it is exposed intentionally, this nullifies the prayer. If it was little and exposed unintentionally throughout the whole prayer, the prayer is valid. Example, a woman is praying and part of her hair is coming out. She is not aware of that. She finishes the prayer. Someone tells her, the full four rak'ahs, your hair was coming out. She wasn't aware that prayer is valid. Thirdly, if something of the extreme aura, let's assume that her thigh or her buttock for any example, or as a man as well. If it was exposed for a very short time, the wind blew all of a sudden and exposed it, and one took care of it and covered it immediately, there's no problem. But if it was exposed throughout the whole prayer, even if unintentionally, she has to uh, repeat the prayer. Abdul Latif says, on Friday, I, was, uh, I, I had to miss... Asr and Maghrib and Isha because I was taken into the emergency. Will Allah forgive me? If you were able to pray, Allah will not forgive you. If you were sedated, if you were in a case that you were unaware of yourself, you forgot, then Allah is most forgiving. Uh, Karim says, well, Karim has a long uh, a question, but I'm afraid we are out of time. Maybe, inshallah. Uh, Karim and uh, Rida's questions might be addressed next week. So until we meet then, I leave you for Amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. J is for Jannah, the garden of paradise. Ha is for Hajj, the blessed pilgrimage. Kha is for Khatim, the seal of the prophethood given to the prophet. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Is for taqwa, be wearing of Allah And tha is for thawab, a reward J is for Jannah, the garden of paradise Ha is for Hajj, the blessed pilgrimage Kha is for Khatim, the seal of the prophethood Given to the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam